And if you're watching from San Jose, would you just simply shout, an uncommon community. Yeah, and those of you who are watching online from various places, just shout, an uncommon community. We're going to talk about that a bit today. Our passage for the day is really often called the Great Commission. It's Jesus' post-resurrection where he uh, commissions the early disciples to go and unleash this worldwide history-transforming movement that we now call the church. Let's read what happens on that occasion. Matthew 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Now, if you were with us last week, you know that we talked about the fact that all of us have access to the greatest power in all creation, and that is God himself, who shows up and comes into history through the person of his son, Jesus. And it is Jesus who we hear speak to us across the vistas of time, come follow me. In other words, come plug in. And last week I told you that to plug into Jesus is not simply to have a casual kind of faith. If you want to get uh, to a place where your faith is world changing and life transforming. But it is to have a kind of faith in Jesus that says he is the source for all and he's above all. He's the highest point of my loyalty, my commitment, and my love. We call it a Jesus first faith. Shout, a Jesus first faith. Yes. Here's how Paul describes it. And I, I just love reading Paul's description of, of who Jesus should be in our life, especially in this particular day and time. Listen to how, what Paul says about, about what kind of faith we ought to have. He says, now he, meaning Jesus, is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. And so those who have Jesus first faith, when they gather together in community, I simply call that an uncommon community. And so Jesus first community is an uncommon community that has a common vision and shared values. And today and next week, I want to talk about NBCC in that context. You see, last week I talked about plugging into Jesus. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what it means to plug into Jesus today. Uh, but over the course of today and next weekend, I'm going to also talk about your plugging in to NBCC. Here's why. Because if you're watching me, whether you're sitting in the uh, sanctuary there in San Jose and watching or whether you're watching online from other parts of the country and world, I'm convinced it's not an accident nor an incident. It is the providence of God that has arranged for us to connect in this season in your life. And I suspect that perhaps God is saying to you, it's time to plug in, to go deeper in terms of your relationship with Jesus. But also, if you want that faith to become a world-changing, life-transforming experience lived out in your day-to-day -day life, you need to plug into a local community. And I think that local community just might be NBCC. So I'm going to make a case for that over the course of the next three weeks, talking to you about what our vision is starting today, what our shared values are both today and next weekend, and after that, the fourth weekend, I'll simply give you an invitation to, to, think, to, to, to make a commitment to partner with us in the work that God has called us to do. Whether you are local in the Bay Area, participating in our local campuses, or whether you are participating virtually across the country or across the world, we want to invite you to partner with us. All right. Having said that. There are a couple of words that you need to become familiar with as we begin to talk about the vision and values of NBCC. The first of those words is partnership. Everybody shout partnership. Yeah. Partnership. Last week I told you that when Jesus, when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of our lives, make him the highest point of faith, that, that he calls us into partnership, into the work of redemption and loving radically with him. But he also expects for us to become partners with one another in this unique work called the church. So notice how Paul talks about this. You know, when you say yes to Jesus and you are a baptized uh, believer in Jesus, you're already a member uh, of the church Big C. 
So we don't necessarily use the term membership here at NBCC. We use the term partnership because partnership is about uh, believers deciding that we're going to organize around a particular vision that has a particular set of shared values and move together as Jesus followers this way. This is what Paul is talking about when he writes to believers back in the city of Philippi. Here's what he says. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you. Uh, I make my request for all of you with such joy. For you have been my partners. There it is. Not only have you been Jesus followers, he's saying, but you've committed to support the unique work of the gospel that God has called me, Paul, to do. You have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. So the first word is partnership. We invite you to think about being partners with how God has shaped and called NBCC. The second word that is important is gathering. Everybody shout gathering. We tend not to say church service or church meeting, et cetera, et cetera, here. Our chosen word is gathering because, because of the, the pliability of it, if you will. All right? Shout again. Gathering. Listen to the words of Jesus when he says, where two or three gather together as believers in his name, there he is in the midst. He's right there. I love that passage because as we extrapolate that passage, here's what we say. Where two or three believers gather together, bought into our vision and our shared values, there is an expression of an NBCC gathering. Whether it's in a prison, like we read last weekend where Paul and Silas were there. If, if several folk are, are gathering around our vision and values in the prison, that's an NBCC gathering. Or whether it's in where you're sitting by the hundreds in one of our sanctuaries in the Bay Area, that's an NBCC gathering. Or whether you're sitting in one of our many small groups across the local Bay Area, uh, following up and studying the message that you heard taught on Sunday, that's an NBCC gathering. Or whether you're in Georgia or Alabama or, uh, or, or one of the New England states like Maryland or in South Korea or in Nigeria, all places where people are watching us. And if you're sitting around your computer screen or around your TV watching our regular uh, weekly worship gathering and hearing me teach with others, and those others are bought into our vision and our values, that's an NBCC gathering. Right there. You know, uh, over the last couple of years, we've all experienced the great migration. People have moved all across the country. And uh, tons of NBC uh, folk have moved across the country here in America as well. And so we started to reach out to them uh, about a year ago and say, hey, when you get settled, uh, don't just settle for watching uh, our worship on your TV screen or computer. I want you to consider inviting your family and your friends and colleagues and the new people there. Invite them to come and watch with you. And if at some point they can buy into our vision and our values, then God can begin to raise up an NBCC community right there where you are. And one couple, Mark and Mejia in Atlanta, they received that invitation, prayed about that invitation, and ultimately they said yes to it. And here's what Mejia said to me in a, such a wonderful, with a, with, a, with a real joy beaming from us. He said, listen, when we got to Atlanta, they were NBCC partners with us here in the Bay Area, and they moved to Atlanta. And she said, when we got to Atlanta, we purchased this beautiful home. And she said, when I walked into the house, I looked around, and I said, this house is big enough to hold a church. And she said, after you reached out to us and gave us this invitation, I got it. I said, Yes. I think God gave us this house. One of the reasons is to raise up an NBCC community right here in Atlanta. And they're committed to doing that. I was talking to another person, uh, Millie, actually, in Boston, Massachusetts. And he used to be a former member of a church I pastored there many years ago. And, and she was saying that her and her husband and family are so busy that they've decided, since they can't get out to church, that they're going to watch us, not on a Sunday, but on a, on a Wednesday evening, a weeknight, when they can gather together. And, uh, and, and do it as a family. But then when she heard about what Mahe and them had said in Atlanta, she said, well, how come you didn't ask us to reach out to our family and friends and raise up an NBCC? Why didn't you ask us? We can do that right here. Fabulous. Wherever people gather together around our vision and our values, there is an NBCC community. 
And perhaps wherever you are, in San Jose or across the country, God is saying he wants you to be at the center of an NBCC gathering, community, an uncommon community. Now let's talk about our vision. Let's spend the bulk of our time today just really kind of unpacking what is our vision. Well, you know, Pastor Rick Warren, the uh, now retired pastor of Saddleback Church, uh, used to often say, a great commitment to the great commission and the great commandment leads to a great church. And I couldn't agree with him more. And so let's begin with the great commission because it is literally uh, the foundation upon which our vision statement stands. We have four vision pillars that shape who we are at NBCC, and they are shaped by the Great Commission. So let's just reread it again, just so that you, you can connect with it. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything, shout everything, I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So the first vision pillar that shapes who we are as an uncommon community here in NBCC is that we are committed and called and we exist to reach those who feel far from God. Notice the word feel. Everybody shout feel. You see, I don't think that any of us are far from God. But the reality is that many of us feel far from God. And so when we say we want to reach folk who feel far from God, we're not just talking about people who've never heard about Jesus or, or people who need to come to faith in Jesus. Yes, we include that. But we're also talking a whole lot about this reality, that we exist to be a place for the hurting, the lonely, the forgotten, the traumatized. We exist to be a place for the discouraged, the depressed, the hopeless, the confused, the disappointed, the frustrated. We're a place where, where individuals like those who feel far from God can come and find love and a loving embrace and healing and clarity for their confusion and empowerment and forgiveness and redemption and direction that they can come here be a part of an NBCC gathering wherever that is and find their inspiration and help and hope. We exist for you and your friend and your family member who's struggling with depression or trauma, who feels isolated and alone and disconnected. You are our vision. You are our mission. We exist for you. You know, oftentimes, People don't come to church not because they don't believe in Jesus, because they've experienced some trauma in church. I remember a number of years ago, one of our volunteers said, uh, told me this remarkable story. She said she had talked to a friend of hers, had been talking to her for about a year, trying to get her to come to church. So she came to NBCC. And there in the lobby, when her friend got ready to go into the sanctuary, she froze. Evidently, 30 years earlier, she hadn't been in the church. She hadn't been to church for about 30 years. Whenever she left the church, some trauma happened that caused her to leave. And perhaps she had a flashback right there. She froze. You, she could see her trembling. And so the NBCC partner who had invited her did what we expect all of our partners to do. She didn't say, well, just go. You can go. She said, grab my, take my arm. And she walked her in, sat her down, sat with her through the entire worship experience uh, and, and the friend had a wonderful time. The community was loving. And on her way out, the friend said, with a smile on her face, I'm home. That's why we exist, guys. We exist for people who feel thrown away and overlooked and rejected, who feel unlovable and unworthy to come and, and respond to the love of Jesus and be able to say here in an NBCC gathering, wherever that gathering might be, I am That's what we mean when we say we exist to reach those who feel far from God. And then the second pillar, uh, uh, vision pillar is to make disciples. And when we say make disciples, coming right out of that great commission, 
We mean that we want to empower and equip you to live like Jesus lived when he was on the earth and to love like Jesus loves now, radically and without condition. And the text says, uh, make disciples of all nations. Now, the Greek word under that word nation is really a word that is ethnos. The Greek word for ethnos is, the Greek word for ethnos, uh, you, you, you catch the connection already, like ethnic groups. It means people groups. Make disciples of all people groups. And if you, if you ever come and experience an NBCC gathering here in the Bay Area where our two campuses are, you just look around. One of the things that pops out to you is this remarkable diversity that we have, we have people from all kinds of groups, uh, 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 radical diversity, right across class and race and ethnicity. We have poor people and wealthy people, people who are Republican, Democrat, people liberal and conservative, all worshiping mixed up together. It is powerful. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about that next week, but I just simply want to say that that is at the very heart of our vision, who we feel that God has uniquely called us to be. And so one of our values is everybody matters to God, so everybody matters to us. And when we say everybody, we mean everybody. Come on, shout everybody. Shout again, everybody. Yes, everybody, whoever you are. Here's the deal about God, that, that, that everybody matters to God. God loves us all. That doesn't mean that God supports or endorses every philosophical or religious position or political position that we hold or thought that we may think. It doesn't support or endorse, endorse every choice, lifestyle choice or whatever choice it is that we might make. But he loves us. God loves us despite the choices and despite the philosophical and religious positions that we may have. God loves you whether you're living a, a so-called raggedy life or a so-called righteous life. God loves you. You matter to him. Even if you don't believe in God, God believes in you. And that is the community we're called to be, a community that says that while we may not agree with everything that everybody is, 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 is doing or engaging with, that if you come to an NBCC gathering, wherever we are in the world, you will discover that you matter, that we love you. And even if you're having a hard time to believe in the church, I want you to know we believe in you. And then thirdly, building families. It's a huge part of our vision to equip you to build families. But, but even equally as important, to be family. And when I think about NBC's role in building families, I think about Psalm 68, 6. I love this. It says, God places the lonely in families. You know, a couple of years ago, the current Surgeon General of the United States wrote a book, and he chronicled the horrendous epidemic, watch this, of loneliness here in America. And as I think about it, one of the reasons why I think that people are struggling with loneliness here in America is because so often we have to put on a kind of false front. We can't allow people to see who we really are, right? At work, in school, among the friends that we are. And so often we have to pretend that we're strong when in fact we're just weak. We have to pretend that we have all the answers when in fact all we have are questions. We have to fit somebody else's criteria for cuteness or what a swag is. And we feel like we can't let our guards down and just be authentically who we are. But one of the amazing things about why we're called the Bill family and how we try to do it here at NBCC is because we start off by recognizing that each and every one of us are sinners, desperately in need of being saved by God's amazing grace. And check this out. If you're sitting in an NBC sanctuary there in Ridgewood City, you look to your right or you look to your left or you think about who's behind you, come on, and you recognize that everybody in the room is a sinner, desperately need to be saved by God's grace, and you recognize that the preacher, me, on the stage that you're listening to, wherever you may be listening to across the country and across the world, is a sinner, desperately in need to be saved by God's grace. If that is the fundamental place where we all start, then you can, you can take off the proverbial mask. Come on. Then you can be authentic and vulnerable and transparent and real and only then come on now can you connect with loving and being loved that's key to our community it's key to who we're called to be you see i heard someone say that humility is not about denying your strengths it's about being honest about your weaknesses and here's what here's what scripture says that god opposes the proud but he blesses the humble with his grace. 
I pray is that we are a place of humility, beginning with me and all of our team. A humble place, recognizing our need for each other and for God. And then transforming communities, our final vision pillar. I'm going to talk a lot more about that next weekend. But let me just simply say this. Here's how it comes out of the Great Commission. Jesus says, in teaching them to obey everything, I, shout I, I, shout I, I have commanded you, he says. All right, here's the deal I want you to really get. That at the end of the day, while we're a community, we want everybody to be honest and transparent. At the end of the day, while this is a place where God comes alongside of us and our partners come alongside of each other without judgment, we just meet you where you are. Yet, this is not a place where we just simply pat everybody on the back and say, you okay and I am okay. This is a place where we come together in covenant, in community, and says we've got one primary goal, and that is to become more like Jesus, because Jesus wants to reproduce himself in each and every one of our characters, and so he meets us where he finds us, but his intent is not to leave us where he met us, but to carry us forward into the destiny that he's called for you and me to have. Notice how Paul talks about this in Romans 8, 29. He says, for God knew his people. He knew you in advance. And he chose them. He chose you to become what? Like his son. So that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. You see, we want to, in the words of Scripture, spur each other on forward to becoming more like Jesus. As we work on keep getting better and better and better. It's part of our vision about who we are. Now, there's one more verse I need to highlight before I leave this piece about vision and about our community. You know, the Great Commission actually starts with a fascinating verse. It starts with verse 17. I saved it until now to read it. Here's what it says. When they, the 11 disciples, because unfortunately Judas had taken his life, so it left the 11 disciples. When they saw him, Jesus, coming towards them, about to commission them, Watch this. The text says they worshiped him, but, shout but, some doubted. Isn't that fascinating? They're worshiping and doubting at the same time. Now, the actual next verse starts off, which we read it earlier. It says, then Jesus came to them and said. The suggestion is that he just, he, he kept coming closer and closer and closer. And the assumption is, as he got closer, their sense of who he was and that he was really real and this was not a dream or not a ghost became super clear. And yet, they still couldn't explain how was he dead just a few days earlier, and he's alive now. And so this notion of, of doubt and faith living together. Why am I saying this? Because in an NBCC gathering, wherever we are, there's a key value. We always have room for your doubt. You don't have to hide your doubt. You don't have to pretend like you have all of the answers. And by the way, we're not going to pretend like we have all the answers. By the way, I'm just telling you now, I don't have all the answers. You see, faith, my definition of faith, is not trusting Jesus in the midst of answered questions. It, that's facts. Faith is trusting Jesus in the midst of unanswered questions. So it's not really about what I know, guys. It's about who I know. One of my favorite stories, I've said it before, you might recall it. A young man wins a sweepstake, and as a result, he gets a, a basket in this big uh, store, and the owner says to him, and everybody's standing around, the TV cameras and everything, you got 15 seconds when anything you can get in this back is you get the key. And so the clock starts ticking, and he freezes. He just freezes. At about 12 seconds, his sister's screaming at him, what are you going to do? He looks and he sees the owner standing at the end of the aisle. He, he runs, rolls the basket down as fast as he can. He hits the owner. The owner falls into the basket. He wheels the basket around, runs back up to the front, just in time for the stop to end. And his sister said, do you know you ran into the owner? And the little boy said, I know who he is. But if I've got him in the basket, I've got everything in the store. <laughs> Hey, guys, it's not what I know. It's who I know. If you've got Jesus in the basket of your life, you've got everything he has. And that's what we try to introduce you to in an NBCC community. All right, let's shift just for a moment as we work towards the end of our time together today. That's vision. Everybody shout vision. Yeah, that's the vision we, we, we want to build an uncommon community around. But then here comes the question. 
How do I know that I'm plugged in and spiritually growing? How do I actually know? And what is NBCC role in helping with you, helping with that? Well, this brings us to the great commandment. You know, the, the great commandment, it really comes out of a conversation that Jesus has with, uh, with a young man who's, who's inquiring. Here, here's the conversation. Matthew chapter 22. Teacher, the young man says, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, hmm, you must love the Lord your God with all. Notice all here. With all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Notice again, all demands of the prophets. Now, the fact that, that the emphasis is on all, all your heart, mind, and soul. By the way, we want your faith to keep growing and keep being informed. All your mind is engaged in your faith journey. Check it out. It means that we're all going to always be in process. That's the work of discipleship. We just keep growing because none of us love God without all. And then it says, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I always like to point out that there's no adjective with neighbor. He didn't say love your rich neighbor, poor neighbor. He didn't say love your Republican or Democratic neighbor. If you're here in America, he didn't say love your straight or your gay neighbor. He said love your neighbor. He didn't say love the nice neighbors and hate the, the, the bad neighbors. He said love your neighbor as yourself. All right. So how do I know that this is happening? This is the basis upon which we, be, we begin to grow and become like Jesus. We take this commandment seriously. Well, how do I measure that in my life? Well, I, I, I have something called the triangle of faith. And basically, it's you're asking three basic questions about yourself. It's really measurable. First, is my trust in Jesus increasing? Do I trust him now more than I did last year? Secondly, is my commitment to a Jesus-centered community and to Jesus' teaching, is that deepening? Are there some things that I'm doing now that I wasn't doing a year ago, a year ago, like maybe regularly attending church or watching it online or inviting my family and friends to come or sending a link to family and friends? And then love. Is my heart expanding? You see, trust, commitment, love. Is my heart expanding? Am I more sensitive when I hear about the pain and the struggles of others? Do I find my eyes tearing up? Am I, am, am I giving more of my resources, not just for a tax write-off, but because it's coming out of my space where, where, where I feel a call to give, not just money, but time and talent? My heart expanding. If your answer is yes to any of those three or to two of those three or to all of those three, then you're going. Okay, let me spend the last few moments talking about how we work with you here at NBCC to partner with you to help you to grow, to become more like Jesus. I call these the four spiritual vital signs. My wife is a doctor. She says, you know, the first thing they do when they want to know if you're in a crisis or if you're stable, if you're unconscious, are you alive or, or not alive, right? If you come in for a check-in, check-up, they want to know, are you moving, are you, are you reasonably healthy or not? They check your vital signs. So I want to suggest there are four vital signs that I want to suggest that, that, that are key that we partner with you to help you to become a healthy, growing Jesus follower here at NBCC. I'm only going to focus on two today. All right. Next week, I'm going to pick up the next two and then I'm going to return to this subject of diversity. Hugely important. Make sure you don't miss it. Now, let me frame it this way. Some years ago, Pastor Andy Stanley pastors North Point Church in Atlanta, about 30,000 people. They did a survey with this basic question. When you see a vibrant, growing believer, what are some of the uh, attributes that are alive in their lives? And so we took some of the answers of that, and he took some, and he created these four categories. And we've used these four categories over the years to really kind of describe the partnership role that we have with those that we're, we're helping along the discipleship journey at NBCC. Okay, here's the first one. Engage regularly with practical teaching. It says that if you're going to be a growing disciple, you engage regularly with teaching that just doesn't tell you what you ought to know, but teaches you how to do it. 
Here's the point here at NBCC. When we teach primarily up here, whoever's teaching, we're focusing on not just what you need to know, not just getting you to memorize the word and know the word. Our focus is on getting you to do the word. Listen to what James says. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do, shout do. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're simply fooling yourselves. The transformation in our lives happens when we focus on doing. What we focus on doing as we teach it here. We focus on doing in our, in our life groups, our small groups, as we, as we unpack what, what the pastor or whoever is taught up here teaches doing. You know, uh, a few, about six months ago, I went into the bank. I had to transact some business, not at the tailor, but with the customer service uh, department. And so they told me to have a seat. They were severely understaffed. Lots of folk was there. There were several people ahead of me. They saw those several people. There was a couple of people behind me. They called one of those people. I wasn't in a hurry. I saw how understaffed they were. I just said, just chill out. No worries. The manager recognized they had overlooked me, so he came to me. And, uh, and he, he said, look, have you been helped? And I said, no, but it's okay. You guys are staff. It's going to be okay. He said, no, no, you come go with me. I went into his office and sat down in front of him. He said, something kind of different about you. He said, as a matter of fact, you're kind of familiar. He asked me my name. I told him who I was. I told him I pastored this kind of large regional church. And I told him it's NBC. He said, ah, he said, that's it. That's it. That's it. He said, yes, yes, yes. He says, one of our regular customers is a member of NBCC. He talks about how, how he loves your preaching and he loves your teaching. I said, oh, that's great. He says, well, you know what? He's one of our most obnoxious customers. <laughs> He said, you know, he's loud, he's impatient, he just went down, and I just got smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> Evidently, here's the deal, guys. <laughs> he comes, he listens, he enjoys, but he's not doing. He got to go do. And so, practical spiritual disciplines. Secondly, uh, is uh, what is called practicing spiritual disciples, disciplines. Practicing spiritual disciplines. Practical teaching and practicing spiritual disciplines. Okay, let me tell you this as we move towards an end. My daughter, when she was a baby, she was, of course, nursing. And when she wasn't nursing, I had a bottle, I'd feed her. Soon after that, we start feeding her real food. But before we knew it, six months to a year or whatever, she started grabbing for the spoon. And do you know now, today, <laughs> she's not nursing. She's 18 years old. <laughs> and she feeds herself, guys. Now, here's what we do. We make sure there's food in the house, and her grandma, you know, does most of the cooking, and she even does some cooking herself, but she feeds herself. You see, it's our task uh, uh, to do, to partner with you. You know, we provide the practical teaching, but, but we want to teach you to feed yourself. We provide the food and everything you need. Hence, these disciplines. So a remarkable set of passages uh, in Matthew uh, where Jesus just finished talking about the Sermon on the Mount, the hard stuff on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, look, adultery is not just being involved physically. It's about what you think. He says, look, I'm calling you to love your enemies, all that hard stuff. And then he shifts to the disciplines that gives you the power, allows him to empower your life to begin to do those things. I call it the win you section, right? Here's, here it goes. The first thing he starts with in, in chapter 6, verse 2, he says, when you give. Jesus suggests that it's the very first thing he names is that giving, being generous is a huge part of his ability to transform our heart, expand our heart. And so here in NBCC, we say we are generous to others and to God because God has been so generous to us. And then in verse 5, he says, when you pray, and he teaches about how prayer is not just about asking God for stuff, but positioning us for God to ask us of stuff. And all the dimensions of prayer is central to your relationship. Here at NBCC, we say we pray because we believe in relationships with God. And then fast, it says in verse 16, when you fast, he highlights fasting as a, as a spiritual. I know that a lot of people are doing what they call uh, intermittent fasting, reconnected to its spiritual roots. Jesus teaches us to fast. And then the psalmist kicks in here with teaching us to regularly engage in the Word. The people who are growing, uh, uh, they, they understand this passage. The psalmist says, I rise before dawn and I cry for help. I have put my hope in your Word. Those who are vibrant in their faith often start their day off engaging in God's Word. 
And then Galatians, Paul tells us about another key aspect, serving. Everybody shout service. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, we're called to be free to do what? To serve one another humbly in love. And so people are vibrating in their faith. They're not just sitting and watching in a local uh, NBCC campus, come on now, or watching us online, but they're engaged in serving, in you know, virtually serving, serving in person. And then they take that serving attitude into the world. And then they share their faith. People who are vibrant and growing, they find a way to share their faith. Look at what the psalmist says. Join me in spreading the news. Together, let's get the word out about God. Well, what am I going to say about God? Well, I'm going to tell my story. God met me more than halfway. He freed me from the anxious fears. Here's two things I want you to remember. Never hide your faith and never impose your faith. Simply live it and share it in the natural course of your life. You, you, someone tells you about a podcast or a TED Talk that they heard, don't be embarrassed to tell them about a message that you saw on video or a message uh, that you heard me teach that was inspiring or a scripture that you read that really spoke to you just in the natural flow of life. When you talk about how you got from there to here and you know that God was a huge part, don't leave God out of the story. Share. All right, here's the deal. If you're doing any of those things, you don't have to do all of them, but if you're doing any of those things, that suggested that, that, that your vital signs are moving in the right direction. You see, you see, I, we and our team provide the teaching, but, but it's your task to, to learn how to feed yourself. And when you begin to engage like this, and here's some good news, guys, then this is how you find peace when life around you is falling to pieces. This is how you find courage when that thing that is in front of you is the source of overwhelming fear. This is how you become a light shining in darkness without having to be perfect or flawless. But here's where we're going to end today. Praise God. <laughs> I'm talking about an uncommon community called NBCC. Check this reflection question out. Make sure you get back here next week. Here's a reflection question. Based on what you've heard today, what is one thing that makes NBCC an uncommon community to you? And whatever you do, see me next weekend. God bless you.